fail a lot over the last several years with, with Bryn, and you've made a, a number of amendments, and but just as a reference. And then also, you, know, you had your big bail bill in 2018, H728, where you made a number of substantial changes. That's where you went from um, assuring, uh, setting bail from uh, for the purpose of assuring appearance, court appearance, to moving to mi mitigating the risk of flight. You set the $200 uh, bail amount for those uh, fences that uh, could be expunged, things like that. So I just wanted to kind of just have those for you as a little bit of a refresher. So Senator Sears is correct that the current uh, language that you have in the Constitution, which you'll see in the bill in section, in the proposal in section <coughs> two, um, is, was adopted in 1994 by the voters. So it had been approved by, uh, by the legislature in two previous bienniums. And that's where you had the new language come in with regard to being able to withhold bail in cases where uh, if there's a felony offense, um, an element of which involves an act of violence against another person, um, and uh, clear and convincing evidence that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at this, may be held without bail when the evidence of guilt is great and the court finds based upon clear and convincing evidence that the person's release poses a substantial threat of physical violence to any person and no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably prevent physical violence. So that was that was new language in the constitutional amendment. It was not there prior to that. Um, so what the propo what proposal seven does, which is interesting because the amendment in ninety four was also proposal seven, um, interestingly, um, is it's changing uh, simply changing felony to a criminal offense. So it's broadening it to include misdemeanors. Um, so it's what it's trying to do is set kind of a level playing field with regard to misdemeanors and felonies when there's an element of violence and, um, and uh, the court believes that withholding bail is the only way to protect the public. So, um, so again, this kind of goes to what uh, Senator Sears was trying to do, which is to say if we have kind of a, a setting the foundation, a level playing field as it, if you're focused just on dangerousness, um, and you're making determinations based on risk assessments, maybe it's a misdemeanor offense, so maybe it's a domestic assault case and with, uh, as a misdemeanor, and, but then based on the risk assessment, there's a high, there's a high risk there with regard to dangerousness. Um, should it be an option for the court to make a determination that um, a person might be able to, or should be able to be held without bail? Can I ask a question about that? Doesn't number three in the Constitution do that? It says any person awaiting sentence or sentence pending appeal may be held without bail for any Well, that person's sentence. already been convicted. Awaiting, sentence. oh, awaiting sentence yeah. or sentence. Uh, there, oh, I see. Yeah, okay. So somebody who's already been convicted Got and is just waiting sentencing. Okay. Yep. So what is the range of violent misdemeanors? You mentioned domestic assault. What you know, I'd have to take a look in, at, you know, and you'd have a variety of options, but, um, you know, I'd have to take a look, but we could. We could look at listed offenses. We could mm -hmm. look at things in the, you know, in the domestic assault statutes. Um, I think that's going to probably be the main one that, mm -hmm. that folks are looking at, but I don't know. I think probably some of the witnesses can talk to you about what they Close see more. in their practice. Okay, so a person held without bail prior to trial shall be yes. entitled to review of that determination by a panel of three Supreme Court justices within seven days. Right. That's okay. Right. That's the evidence, the way that that's that formal process. I'm sorry. They have a hearing on the uh, whether the evidence of guilt is great. Yes. Yep. Um, it's clear and convincing standard. Okay. And all of these three things would have to pertain. <clears throat> Guilt is great, yes. substantial threat, and no conditions would reasonably right. So prevent. the same standards that are used okay. now for, yeah. for violent felonies. Mm -hmm. um, and I will just note that it's just interesting, I was asking some other folks again who, who you know, are out there and, and practice in this area, but um, I was wondering about how uh, is it working now with regard to, is there any disagreement about what constitutes uh, 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 a violent felony, um, and there didn't seem to be, uh, people didn't seem to think that there was a problem, but there's not necessarily a definition. We have a definition of 
nonviolent felonies, I believe, in statute. But it, that's a, it goes to your question about kind of what offenses would we be talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then just um, as a refresher, so you have the, the language in the Constitution, but you also have under 7554 under your bail statutes, that's where you have you know, your subsection A, subdivision 1 is these are the conditions that you can set to uh, to uh, mitigate risk of flight, and then subdivision A2, these are the ones that you can use to protect the public. And the diff you know, main difference being those two is that you can set bail for purposes of mitigating risk of flight from prosecution, but you cannot set it for purposes of protection of the public. What were they thinking in 1994? You know, I, I was thinking about it it'd be really interesting. I haven't done it, really dug into the legislative history about that, but I might talk to Michael Trinick about that and see if we can pull some well, information and look at that. Um, I was on this committee. We're here. We're here. Yeah. Um, but I was brand new and, you know, just a young whippersnapper. Um, but Vince Luzzi has a lot of history with this. Oh. Um, because Vince was on the committee when they, you know, I was here after the, when it went to the voters in 94. I was not here when they passed the constitutional amendment the first time. But I remember right after the amendment became effective, there was a tremendous argument between John Bloomer Sr. Vince and some other long-term members of this committee with the Supreme Court over their decisions in how to apply the bail. And from then on, there was a feeling that what the legislature intended and what they thought the voters intended was not what was done. Uh, um, <coughs> the, that I believe that, um, and I, I have to <coughs> recollect, that the real dispute was over some of these issues of who could be held which we're right back to today. Um, and uh, so and I don't, you know, I, again, I wasn't as involved because I, I thought that it passed in 90, I thought that um, 93 was the effective date to do amendment. I'll check it. Well, well, not, it was, I think, adopted by I the voters elect, in I was, My first year was 93. And I'm thinking it was 92 when it was adopted. It says in the Constitution, it says in here, 1994. Well, then they must be right. Right. So I it was adopted and approved I lost a year. during the 91 and 93 biennial sessions. Okay, 94. So I got yep. here and I, I, didn't, I was elected in 1992 and started serving in 2003. So that was, yeah, 2004 no, would be my second year. 1993, not 2003. 1993. Yeah, and 94 would have been the general. But I think election. there was there was even disagreement back then, and I don't remember who the chief justice was then. But there was, and I know John Bloomer and Vince went over to the Supreme Court. It'd be interesting to hear Vince's yeah. um, take on it. I know they went to the Supreme Court on a couple of times to argue that mm -hmm. the legislature's what the legislative intent was. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking and seeing that in 92, Senator Backus was the only person who voted against it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first day of testimonials. Racine was presiding. I'll pass this around. I have the Senate Journal from 92, if you just oh, want to take okay. a look. So you can see the language, the original language for the, for the, for the prop. Anyway, yeah, that, that was the, so I do remember the, that argument, but I don't remember all the details. But Vince, Vince would probably be the person to ask to come in and testify about what the intent was of the legislature and what, what he thinks. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's changed from being a defense attorney to a prosecutor, so he might have a different view now. Well, since I envision Vince as being one of the first people who will try to bend the envelope, so to speak, in applying this, um, this is the first day of testimony. I don't see anybody on here who would be talking about the specific number of, I'll start with the lowest, simple assault by mutual fray and work your way up. Um, there's a whole lot of cases out there that fall into that violent category. And I would like to know what the, the potential is 
especially on how that interfaces with what we're trying to figure out corrections, how many beds do we need? I, I, I think it could be a substantial I think, hit. I think what I was what, what I what I said in the beginning, Joe, is what um, matters to me is that um, we want a bail system that's obviously constitutional, but we also want a bail system that only holds people that are high risk to read to to the public um, for themselves and not holding people that aren't. And whether it's a constitutional amendment that takes that, some people who commit what would be considered minor offenses are extremely dangerous. Other people who commit what would be considered very violent offenses are not high risk to be and obviously if it's a murder you want to hold them because of the nature of the crime. But um, there is there are studies regarding murder and the likelihood of reoffense. But I'm not asking the court to, to do that. So if we're going, if we're look, really looking at a constitutional change here, if there's questions about crim, just adding criminal in here and <coughs> violent and stuff, why don't we just really change the constitution and write what we want it to say? Well, about that's bail. one option. The other Instead option would be to, to the other option would be to make certain currently misdemeanor domestic violence offenses felonies. Well, but, but I mean, we could, if we're going to change the Constitution, we can rewrite it, rewrite that whole thing so that it says what we want it to say instead of just of trying to tinker with it. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, so my, my knowledge of what happened in New York is skeletal, but am I right that one of the, the drivers for it is the idea that bail-like roadside stops can be disproportionately yeah. used against people of color and both? Poor people. But evidently, what happened in New York was they had such a blanket thing that people who committed vehicle vehicular manslaughter were being are being released to were already being held, mm -hmm. so they're being let out of jail, and others like that. And so obviously, well, every, time, the, the every time one of those happens, the press is there to say this dangerous guy and the victims there to. Well, not, not looking at what went wrong with what they did, but the impetus for what they the did. The impetus was to lower the number of people held on bail, on bail conditions because it was considered right. all the things that we already know, that poor people are more likely to be held than people of color. But this goes the opposite direction. And not really. I think it well, no. no the, goal, the goal is not to go in the opposite direction. The goal is to get to a system that is risk-based rather than um, Offense-based. Well, but, but I guess what I'm saying is, if if we're determining on um, <clears throat> risk and threat, that's where I think the advocates to change uh, to reform the system talk about, especially black <clears throat> males being viewed persistently as higher risk than others, and that accounts for. So people think that they're applying a risk-based standard, but often they're applying a in effect, a racist standard that views a white defendant as less of a threat than a black defendant. I, I, I think that uh, don't believe that the risk-based standards that we have today are, are um, have that problem attached to them. I think they're individualized enough to, you know, that you have the, the different assessments that corrections used today are pretty well established nationwide. It's not an individual deciding whether they're at risk or not, is it? Isn't it a, a judge? It's a judge. No, but they use, but they, they're using the, the, the assessment. Beings. Right, but, but their Maybe. assessment is affected by it. No, no, I don't think, no. well, no, the assessment isn't, shouldn't be affected. I mean, if there were, there's, there's all kinds of studies on risk assessment where it went wrong, and what went wrong was not the risk, not the assessment itself, but how it was applied. For example, in Hawaii, there was a whole series of cases where people weren't trained properly in the risk assessment. They were doing risk assessments, and they screwed it up completely. Um, but it wasn't because the risk assessment was bad. It was because the, the training was poor, and the people who do the risk assessment were poor, but were you know, not doing a good job. But um, as I understand it, in Vermont, anyway, the risk assessments are pretty 
uh, pretty good. The question is getting to that risk assessment. If you're a defense attorney, you don't necessarily want your client being assessed for risk if it's going to affect their um, liberty. But I mean, am I understanding correctly? So somebody is suspected of domestic assault. They're brought into court. It, isn't it that the judge looks at what the prosecutor is? If it's a misdemeanor, the judge cannot rule it out. Cannot. No, but if this passed. This passed, <coughs> then you then be able to hold someone who's considered to be a high risk. And that's a danger to them. Yeah, that's, my, the, that's my point. We would be increasing the number of situations where people could be held without bail on the say so of the judge, which could theoretically be affected by. <coughs> it could. Yeah. It could increase oh, the number. Oh, I see what you're Yeah. Because it doesn't say anything here about risk assessment or doing no. anything at no, all. It just says, yeah, I yeah. yeah. It could increase the number, and it yeah. also could theoretically um, have more appropriate hold system. Yeah. I don't have any doubt it's going to increase the number. I just want to know how many. Well, before you kill the bill, no, uh, I don't know. you know, let's let's give it a fair hearing. Um, and I, you know, you, when you say things like that, Joe, it makes me. Um, <coughs> I hope we're all on the same goal here. I just the goal is to lock people up who are dangerous to themselves or others, and. That's, I mean, we should not be locking people up who are not dangerous. If that's, everybody agrees on that philosophy, then how do we get there? And I, I believe there are a lot of people who are locked up in the state who do not need to be incarcerated. I don't know the number, but you will see in the Justice Reinvestment Study, there may be a lot of women who are being held, are incarcerated, who don't need to be in a locked facility. They may be just as well treated in a more open environment, less restricted. They may need to be in some facility. I believe there are a lot of people that are being held with it on bail who have significant mental health problems. And the reason they're being held is because we don't have a mental health bed for them. And we don't have the treatment available for them. I also believe there are a lot of people that are being held because of their offense, not necessarily because of their risk to reoffend or dangerousness. So I think, you know, if we all agree on the goal, I don't give a damn if we do a constitutional amendment, if we change the a particular category of crime so it's eligible. I, I don't care how we get there. I just want to make sure we have a system. That's all I care about. I don't necessarily disagree with you, Dick. I just figured that before you and I both get called out of this room, yeah. The next time we come back to talk about it, I'd like to have the people on the witness list who are able to tell us what the prospective number of these situations would be, because you are definitely broadening the category of offenses that could be subject to this. And a judge finding those three criteria could potentially <coughs> place somebody without bail in this system that we're trying to adjust the numbers on. Let's make sure we hear those numbers and throw that into the mix of the conversation. Yeah, but I agree. We <laughs> certainly would, should be aware of what we were doing and how that would impact. It's sort of like the argument over in the Education Committee. Um, should we require people to uh, stay in school till they're 18 or until they attain their degree, high school degree? Oh, no, we can't do that because we can't afford to keep, them, keep 18 and 17, 16 and 17 year olds in school. If, they, if we don't let them quit, we'd have to pay more money. Um, I mean, you know, that's a ludicrous argument. How, but, how would you like to sign my bill that I'm handing in today? Huh? How would you like to sign my bill that I'm handing in today? Is this you and Bobby? What, I mean, Bobby isn't even on at this point. Oh. He would probably like to be. The change is the dropout age to 18, unless you have you know, gone through another course of study or something or whatever. But, yeah, Dick is right. Every year that you guys have put that in, the first thing that happens is the whole educational right. establishment comes in and makes the argument that they're just... It's going to cost you more. That, yeah. Which is ridiculous. And they say, oh, we don't have the space. We have tons of space. I, I, I'm happy to sign on to that. I didn't, mean, I didn't realize you were doing the bill again, so... Happy to sign on now. This is like the third time. Um, that wasn't why I brought it no, up. No, 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 I know. I know. Um, 
So but I do think I do think it has, you know, it's worth this guy. Anyway. So I was just going to say, Joe, I can reach out to a crime uh, research group and, and try to get some numbers for you on those misdemeanors. I think, that we're, we're, only, I think we're really only talking domestic violence listed crimes, not. Well, in our my, when I look at it, maybe that what not what it says, Marshall, but what the intent is. No, no, I, I'm just trying to be honest here and, and say, you know, we I introduced this because I thought it was a, a, a way to have this discussion after talking with Cahill, and evidently California's more risk-based um, system. And I don't care how we, we can do a bill, we can do the constitutional amendment, we can do anything we want. So who are the people who would be able to help us understand how we how could many? achieve that? without doing the constitutional amendment, without being in conflict well, I, with the, the Constitution. I think the governor has a proposal. I think that the, um, I think the state's attorneys may oh, have okay. a proposal. So, I think we, that, uh, there are other groups who have some proposals. Okay. So, without doing a constitutional without amendment. Without doing a constitutional amendment. Okay. Can I just ask one question before you go? So this, it says substantial threat of physical violence to any person. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't include <coughs> Some intent says they're going to blow up a building, but they're saying they're going to do it without injuring any people. They're going to blow up something that's a remote building. Is that do they? they um, this is just based on what the what the current language is. I can look and see how that's been interpreted, but um, so it's just well, the same so because it's not changing any of that standard <coughs> language that's in there now. It's just change, the only okay. changes to um, to section 40 are changing from. A felony to a criminal offense. All right, thank you. Hi. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Jay Cushing Johnson, the Governor's Legal Counsel. Um, so, anyway, we were very heartened by Senator Sears' uh, constitutional amendment. Um, I do appreciate the comments that uh, Senator Sears has made about the system being a risk based system, and I think that we agree that we need to keep people who shouldn't be in jail out of jail. I mean, ideally on the early stages so that you're talking about prevention and early intervention and people are diverted out of the system before they become part of the system because we, I think, our greatest problems are in the areas of recidivism and people who are in the system. Um, so um, we have over many, several decades, established a variety of programs, um, developing, developed sentencing options yeah. with the goal of safely lowering um, criminal justice population through diversion. Yeah, we're going to call David. David Taylor wants to listen. Oh, okay. I think that's loud. <laughs> Still has a state phone. He hasn't technically resigned yet. Oh, he's still got he's delayed his resignation. Uh, did you say hello? Hello? Hello, oh, David? Who there? They shut off his email. Hello? <laughs> Are you there, David? <laughs> I, I'm there. Sorry, it's just a little broken up on the other end. Okay. I'm glad you still have a phone, David. Oh, uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> Um, uh, Jay Johnson from the governor's office is uh, speaking right now. Hi, hey, David. Good for sorry to interrupt. That's fine. Um, so anyway, we, it's essential the state delivers the level of service necessary to effectively identify needs and connect people to care and programming. Um, so, but the thing is, we also need to ensure the accountability for those who require more traditional court sanctions and incarceration. Um, so we really are also focused on what the expectations of Vermonters is uh, when we're talking about dangerous individuals in the community. Um, so because our primary responsibility is the safety of Vermonters and our communities. So one thing that we found very interesting about the work that the uh, Council on State Governments is doing is um, the numbers with respect to the violent crime rate in Vermont um, which I think we need to acknowledge that since 1990 has increased 33%, while in the same period the U.S. violent crime rate has decreased 48%. Um, we're lucky our numbers are small. Vermont is um, one of the safest states in the nation. Um, but research done by the CSG shows that since 2014, <coughs> reports of crimes against persons are up 38%, so violent crimes. Um, 
high vo high volume reported crimes decreased across the street across the state, but simple assault, which is one of the high volume crimes, increased 15 percent. Uh, reports of rape has increased um, have increased 152 percent. Reports of intimidation have increased 181 percent, and reports of aggravated assault have increased 65 percent. So again, our numbers are low. We're one of the safest states, but those increases concern us when that's not the trend across the country. Um, those are reported crimes, but over the past five years, felony convictions have grown, driven by increases in assault, domestic violence, and sex offenses. Um, and this is actually in the third report of the CSG. Um, they've done a series over the last several months, and so it's it, um, all of them are worth looking at, but that um, definitely is the one where I'm getting this information. And the other reports also put a lot of this into context in, uh, f with respect to various other issues, and so um, I really recommend you know, becoming familiar with those reports. Um, is that on our website? I found it on theirs, um, oh, and I can, I can give you the link, yeah. If you could give us the link, that would be great. Sure. What report are you looking at? The CSG, uh, the CSG are reports from I guess October, November, December. The ones that I'm getting this data on are the third report, which I think is November. I don't know if I've gotten those. Oh, okay. They're on the CSG. I have the presentation, but I don't have any, like, the final report. I can give you their website, and it links, you can find the links to the reports. Um, okay. So, um, about 65% of our sentenced incarcerated population has been convicted of aggregated, aggravated assault, aggravated sexual assault, or murder. Um, and that's from a DOC population table I got in October, um, which I'm sure we can get updated. Um, yet, with the increases in crime, um, typical felony incarceration sentences are one to three years. Um, median, and this is again from the CSG study, median minimum and maximum sentence lengths of incarceration for felony crimes against a person, so violent crimes, are one year for minimum and five years for maximum. I just think most Vermonters would be surprised by the term lengths. Um, typical misdemeanor <clears throat> sentences are less than a year. Um, so in an effort to prioritize public safety, uh, we came up with a menu of ideas which includes uh, imposing bail for violent misdemeanors, um, as well as updating the definition of listed crimes to your question before. Um, so it was a happy coincidence when we talked to Sen Senator Sears that he had introduced this constitutional amendment. Um, we think it's essential that judges have the tools they need to keep our communities safe. And I know that judicial discretion is an issue, as you were indicating before, um, whenever you add a human element. But at the same time, um, we, they, need to, they need tools in order to keep Vermonters safe. So how do you strike that balance? Um, one tool, as we're discussing is bail for violent misdemeanors, um, and again, with a very stringent constitutional test. Guilt is great. There's clear and convincing evidence that the person's release poses of, of substantial threat of physical violence, and no combination of conditions will reasonably prevent the violence. I think that's a fairly stringent test. Um, and I think our concern was, to the extent that we're proposing a constitutional amendment, it's a lengthy, complicated, complex, and um, uncertain process. And uh, we think that an alternative approach would be to increase um, the potential maximum prison terms of certain violent misdemeanors to 30 years, to sorry, 30 months. Um, right now, two years is when is the line between a felony and a misdemeanor, as I'm sure you know. Um, so if you increase that term so that technically those violent misdemeanors are greater than 24 months, you can you you basically have the same application of the felony and violence test, um, and that's in statute and in the constitution. Um, the same test would apply, and it would give judges the tool of bail for these crimes for the safety of the victim and the community. Um, the increased term should include the listed misdemeanors uh, right now, which are domestic assault and stalking. I also can tell you that they are they relate to abuse, which has felony and misdemeanor sentences. Abuse by restraint, which has felony and misdemeanor sentences. Neglect, oh sorry, neglect is felony only. Um, and exploitation of services, which is a misdemeanor. Those right now are the listed misdemeanors. Um, and 
what we actually would also propose is that, oh, so anyway, so with respect to this increased term, uh, the term now for domestic assault and stalking is, uh, domestic violence is 18 months, stalking is two years, so 24 months. So that would mean increasing the term um, for each of those crimes. We would also um, suggest that we, we modernize and update the definition of listed crimes. Um, this definition, which is originally used in a victim rights um, provision of the criminal law, has now used with reference to both bail or to bail criminal history um, statutes and prohibited persons for persons of pur purposes of firearm provision. <coughs> So uh, when we're talking about listed crimes, we're talking about all of those things. Um, expungements, bail, firearms. Um, so we believe that the list should be updated to include crimes that have actually been since enacted and also others that are on the list and others that aren't on the list. Um, so I read, so misdemeanor exploitation of services, misdemeanor abuse, unlawful restraint, unlawful confinement, um, criminal threatening, domestic terrorism, um, felony and misdemeanor hate-motivated crimes, willful and malicious injuries caused by explosives, injuries caused by destructive devices. Um, these are not all misdemeanors. Uh, these are, some of these are felonies, but they are not um, listed crimes. Um, felony and misdemeanor sexual exploitation of children, felony and misdemeanor possession of dangerous and, or deadly weapon in a school bus or a school building or on school property. Um, so we would propose updating that list, and again, not all of these are misdemeanors, but um, to the extent they include misdemeanors, would want those added to the list of listed crimes. Um, so that's it for questions. I'm going to date out of here short. Um, Jay, I realize you've given us a wish list of many things that go far beyond the bill that's actually in front of us to talk about here. Um, having a tool <clears throat> to address the perceived problem is one thing, but in my eyes, using a tool that's a sledgehammer where a, a thumb to put in a thumbtack is a much different conversation. Um, I'm struggling because the way this language is currently written, two individuals who get involved in a pushing, shoving match by mutual consent and pain is popping up, all of a sudden you have a simple assault by mutual affray that is a violent offense. It contains the element of violence. If it's a Yankees fan and a Red Sox fan, you know there's a substantial likelihood they're going to continue to battle with each other. So you're matching uh, the criteria that there's a likelihood of reoffense. And if the judge decides or the prosecutor decides that they're pursuing a hold without bail, um, to me that has a direct impact on the system two ways. One is you're going to have an additional weight of the evidence here. That's a court hearing, and that's going to take court time. The other is if the judge decides that is worthy of being held without bail, it's going to have a direct impact on the number of beds we need to incarcerate people. So I'm curious to uh, know where in the chain of the various crimes that could be considered violent um, it makes sense to make a change as opposed to it doesn't make sense to make a change. And when I'm reading this right now, it doesn't divide anything. It doesn't clarify anything other than to say it's got to be a crime of violence. And to me, that incorporates way too many things. And I'm using the sledgehammer to put in a thumbtack example because that's exactly what I'm reading. Um, so I guess for the purpose of this proposal, um, what I would like to know specifically is what offenses does the administration consider to be a situation that is violent uh, and worthy of being held without bail? Well, so for purposes of Prop 7, um, I would say, first of all, that what the constitutional amendment has done is create a very, you know, a fairly burdensome test. While it may require an additional court hearing, that would be what I would think we would require when you're talking about a person's liberty interest. 
So the evidence of guilt is great. And based upon clear and convincing evidence um, that the person's release poses a substantial threat of physical violence to any person and that no combination or condition no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably prevent the physical violence. I feel like that's a fairly stringent test. Well, um, and we, that's why we have the, developed it for purposes of felony offenses. I mean, I think the Constitution prior to this time really only addressed capital offenses. Let me walk through the following scenario. Alice and I get into a dispute. It rises to the level of physical contact and violence. And we're all we're swearing at each other. If I get a chance outside here, I'm going to wring your neck, whatever the case may be. There are a dozen witnesses in this room, so the evidence of guilt is great. We have injected already the element of violence. The question is, in that situation, if the judge takes those two things into account and then finds that there's no other way to separate Alice and I from having this battle, technically they've met the criteria of holding somebody without bail. To have that conclusion, there has to be a court hearing. There has to be a conversation. So you're increasing the number of court cases. Does the administration believe that a simple assault by mutual affray is the kind of offense that should fall into that category? Well, so what I have done is go through the list of listed offenses, and simple assault is not on the list. So I would say that is not one of them. That's not what this proposition calls for. The proposition doesn't specify listed offenses. That's A. So A, if you were going to take a legislated approach, that would fix that problem. If you were going to say adjust terms. Um, for this, again, I would say that the test is stringent and that courts are reasonable and have the ability to use their discretion. I don't, I don't think, and I mean, again, that's my personal view, um, I believe judge, judges are reasonable. I think that um, it's a fairly stringent test. And that really, the, you're talking about the most violent offenders, and that courts appreciate that. <clears throat> are there probably outliers in every system? Yes, because we're human. Bill? Uh, I, I just want to go down the same road as Joe. I. My inclination, or my uh, maybe my expectation, was that we would perhaps be looking at bail from the reverse perspective. In other words, um, ways in which bail was not advantageous or was not um, built into the system in, in a way that we would like, and maybe reducing um, the the reliance on bail. So this, it seems to me, greatly expands. Um, the ability to keep people without without bail, which I think is potentially an even worse situation than misusing bail to hold somebody. Um, so I, I would just second Joe's, it seems to me a very common sense thing to ask if we extend it to violent misdemeanors, what does that class look like? Are we comfortable with extending it to all those? And if we're not, what are the ones that we can agree we want to extend it to, that seems to me maybe better addressed in legislation than a constitutional amendment, which is going to take years and years anyway. Um, I, I, I have to admit that I'm really confused now. I thought I understood where we were going. Um, and I, I, I'm confused by this, and I'm confused by what you were saying. Because it seems to me that this increases the potential for the use of, of, of keeping people without bail. And I thought our purpose was to, to, to only keep those people, to only impose bail on those people who um, were a risk of flight or danger. And, and that, the Constitution doesn't allow the dangerous touch. I, I, I understand that, but, but, that's but the problem. But what I, so <laughs> I'm confused now because I think both this and what you were saying, Jay, increases the number of people who are going to be held without bail, which is going in the opposite. And I'm, I might be totally wrong here, but that's just listening to everything. That's it seems to me that that's what no, we're that's doing. What I'm, yeah, what I'm, I'm I, and so I don't. Get it? We want to reduce the number of people and only hold the right people. <laughs> I mean, the people who are of danger. So that's the thing. So let's add that to the Constitution. Instead of doing this, let's add a side 
It says, I think I was okay. pretty clear in the beginning. Do yeah. whatever you want. I'm just trying to get the conversation going. Right, I and know. I know. I think that, um, yeah. that we're all in the same, well, maybe we aren't all in the same direction. The goal was to have a more logical bail system that helped people, no matter, and again, I'll go back to what did we learn? We, we, if we go offense-driven, we end up holding people that probably shouldn't be. Right. Yeah. If we go with a system that looks at the risk, and if we can do that in a constitutional manner, then we have a system that's holding people that are actually the dangerous. And I, I think we all agree on that goal. It's the problem is how you get there, and, and that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. And I, mm -hmm. I realized that um, when I first approached this, I had both a bill that I was going to introduce, similar to what Jay's talking about, and a constitutional amendment. And the problem was that it was the view of our legislative council, and I agreed with her, that you couldn't do the bill without a change in the bail constitutional standards. So that's the genesis of this. I don't really care. If, we, if you think we can do a bill that you know, I'm not interested in having more people incarcerated. But I am interested in making sure that those that we do incarcerate are those that we need to incarcerate. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I, so mm -hmm. anyway, I think that's what we're all driving at. Yeah, Jay's we're happy to so. work with you on that. And I am learning along with you as this yeah. uh, discussion so, goes on. I, I just, you know, I, I, I sympathize with your concern, Joe. But until we have a more concrete proposal, I'm not sure it does it any good to find out how many we're talking about until we know if we're just talking about listed misdemeanors, then we take a whole bunch off. If we're, just, if we're doing the, the constitutional amendment as presently presented, then yes, we would have a huge group, and I agree, that's, that would be, that's not what I want. I don't want you and Alice being held. Well, you weren't here. I was trying to use a good example. Yeah, I can easily see that you and I could have an argument during the playoffs season about the Red Sox and the Yankees. And then if that argument Certainly could. if that argument rose to the level of us having violent actions against each other, we're both in a situation of mutual affray, as it would be defined in the criminal system, and your simple assault by a mutual affray has an act of violence, that's the first criteria. Um, the evidence of, uh, the evidence is great in the weight of the evidence hearing because we've got 12 people that have witnessed this and they can all be brought into that hearing. And the likelihood of you and I ceasing that, if a judge decides is not gonna be resolved until after the World Series, the judge could leap to that statement and say, all right, I'm gonna hold without bail. That's a, the far extreme example. But I don't think you can lump, the, you take away the word felony from what's currently in there. I don't think you want to lump every act of violence no. into that category. The listed offenses may be the way to bring a solution to that argument. Yeah. So you're not getting those kinds of cases involved, because otherwise- I don't disagree. I, I, we have a witness on the phone who's at fault. <laughs> oh, that's right. David's on the phone. No, he's going to be Mr. Mom. We can blame him for it. Are you still there, David? I am. Okay. Um, but it was actually a conversation with myself and David Cahill that led to this. Uh, was Allison Clarkson said. involved? Huh? Was Allison Clarkson involved in this? No, Clarkson <laughs> had dinner on the insanity plea. <laughs> okay. That's where that came from. She had dinner on the insanity plea. That's how. It was. They were having dinner. I don't. I, I just, I'm amazed that people go out to dinner and talk about a san, insanity plea. But you know, to each his own on their conversations. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jay. I no, it's okay. I am. I'm finished. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Can I ask Michelle what what, what is the highlighted? Uh, the Mr. 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 Of that. So these are the violent misdemeanors. Yes. That is, so I just wanted to print out your testimony yeah. for oh, listed sure. crimes since Jay was talking about those. So these are listed violent misdemeanors. Yes. Okay. But that's a subset so are, of this universe, which yes. is all violent. Yep. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is stalking, right. actually, 
Well, it's, it's, it's interesting the way that listed crimes is it, it'll it'll list things and then this but the citations in listed crimes doesn't necessarily carve out what the misdemeanor offense is. It's applies to the misdemeanor and a felony offense. So some of those are grouped together. So if you look at like the vulnerable adult ones, um, there's misdemeanor offenses and there's felony offenses in there, but they're all considered to be listed crimes. So I just highlighted to say there is a misdemeanor offense contained in those. And so it's generally like things that Jay was talking about. So you have like your domestic violence, you have violation of APOs, um, uh, you know, stalking, and then the vulnerable adult crimes. Um, so I think David Cahill, did you um, do you want to give some testimony at this point, David? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation, Senator Spears. Uh, Committee, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you again this week. Um, I think it'd be useful right now to ensure that we are all using the same vocabulary so we're not talking past each other. And also, I think it would be useful to provide a brief historical context to give some sort of sense of the momentum behind us and where we could be going. Because this proposed amendment is, is one small piece of a very big puzzle. Um, first, in terms of nomenclature, um, let's make sure that we understand that when we're talking about bail, uh, bail is a requirement to pledge uh, collateral or liquid assets in order to secure release pre-trial having been charged with the crime. Um, for that reason, historically, bail has been pretty good about securing an individual's uh, appearance in court, as in, you know, if, if you have to pledge the farm, you're not likely to flee the jurisdiction uh, because you don't want to have to forfeit the farm that you own. Uh, that's historically how it works. Um, bail has been less effective at, at restraining future conduct, at preventing dangerousness. Uh, and, and by that I mean um, it's the proposition that uh, if I have to pay $25,000, I am less likely to try to kill my wife uh, who I just tried to kill, and that's what brings me to court. Um, that has proven to be a dubious proposition. Uh, also, bail is not particularly effective in uh, uh, restraining future dangerous behavior for individuals of means, because of course bail is something that either you pay or you don't pay. If you are indigent and you can't afford the 25 grand, uh, of course it, it, it inhibits your dangerous behavior because you're in prison. Uh, but if you can pay the 25 grand, then you're out of the community and you can go and commit that further crime that was the concern that caused the bail to be imposed. And then for this historical reason that now in Vermont, bail is something that is only restricted to risk of flight uh, and, and, and lack of appearance in court. It's not something that is imposed for dangerousness. Um, it is also worth noting before we get into the historical perspective um, that an individual's dangerousness, their risk of committing violent crimes in the future, uh, is not necessarily uh, reflected in the crime with which they are charged now. Um, there are individuals who are charged with violent crimes now who are at a very low risk of committing uh, future violent crimes because what they did was a sudden crime of passion in a situation that is unlikely uh, to repeat itself. Um, on the flip side, there are individuals who are charged with seemingly low-level offenses uh, that are objectively quite dangerous. Because what happened was that law enforcement caught them in the planning stages of a very serious uh, event. Um, so oftentimes, we are catching people uh, for crimes like criminal threatening or disorderly conduct by electronic communication. And the net effect is that they have come up with a credible plan to harm others, and they just haven't done it yet. Um, and, and, so, and, and that's why, again, I would caution you against working from a list of offenses and grouping people by the offenses with which they are charged. Uh, with that said, let's go into the historical context. So uh, bail first popped up, as far as I can tell, in medieval England, and the idea was that individuals had to pledge collateral to secure pretrial release only for petty offenses. Um, and medieval England was a society that was expressly divided by class, so no one was offended at the notion that only individuals of means would have access to bail and everyone else would be in pretrial detention, and everyone charged with an offense other than a petty offense would be in pretrial detention with no ability to post bail. They were effectively the subject of hold without bail orders. 
Uh, fast forward to the founding of the United States. Uh, we have a number of state constitutions. It's worth probably looking for our purposes at Pennsylvania and Vermont. Um, Vermont's original criminal justice provisions in its constitution are heavily borrowed from Pennsylvania, uh, which in turn was inspired by the Quaker movement. Uh, the Quakers saw uh, themselves as enlightened and progressive for the day, specifically on criminal justice matters. And from their perspective, it was enlightened to offer bail to a broader group of individuals uh, than those just charged with petty offenses and those who were just members of the upper class. So it was a statement in the Constitution, a public policy statement, that um, all offenses will be available except for uh, offenses punishable by death or life imprisonment. Um, of course, because bail is a money system, it still had a regressive effect that you had to be able to post the bail in order to have the benefit of the bail system. Um, but it is also worth recognizing that the Society of Pennsylvania uh, and also society in Vermont was very different than it is today. Um, there were no, uh, there, were, there were very few urban centers. Manufacturing had not yet taken off and we're talking about largely agrarian societies. Why do I mention that? Because agrarian societies are landed societies and individuals typically have money that they can pledge as collateral. So what that means is that when the founders of our respective states were contemplating bail, they were contemplating the ability of agrarian families to post their land as collateral to secure appearance. So the notion was that your average person would be able to make bail. Um, and also still, uh, in those societies, um, bail was something that could be used to mitigate not only risk of flight, but risk of dangerousness. And hold without bail was available for the violent offenses. Um, fast forward to today, our current version of our Constitution indicates that offenses punishable by life imprisonment or felony crimes of violence are eligible for hold without bail. So they are outside the money system. And the court can make it dangerous at determination. Um, all other offenses are presumptively still in the money system, where it's pay to play. Uh, if you can post bail, you get out. If you can't post bail, you stay in. Um, and we're not supposed to use bail for dangerousness. Now, the reality is that because judges recognize that some individuals are dangerous, even though they are not charged with the hold without bail eligible offense, um, judges are indirectly using the bail system to hold individuals for dangerousness. And here's what I mean. A uh, judge could very well say to a defendant, uh, Mr. Smith, I see you're charged with criminal threatening, uh, but you, uh, it's evident from your journal and from your statements in court uh, and from your statements to the police that you were intent on killing your wife. Because you were intent on killing your wife, I find that you were at risk of further flight or not appearance, and based upon that risk of flight, I'm imposing bail in your case. Um, so the system right now is using this elaborate workaround to try to detain individuals for dangerousness when, in reality, the constitutional and statutory structure does not allow it. Uh, what we have before us is an opportunity to reform the system in two ways at once. First, we can reduce the effect of or wholly eliminate the monetary bail paid to play system. And secondly, we can expand the authority of judges to hold individuals without bail when they are objectively dangerous. Now, um, I too am concerned about judicial discretion, prosecutorial discretion. And that is why, if we were to re-envision the system, we might think about plugging some objective risk assessment tools into the system. Um, and, and what I am envisioning is that an amendment like this would pass. Then it would be followed by enabling statutes um, that are restricting the use of monetary bail while authorizing the use of hold without bail for those who are deemed objectively dangerous. And also setting forth the criteria that courts are to use in finding that an individual is objectively dangerous. Um, and you know, no risk tool is perfect. Um, it would be unwise to say the judge must use X risk tool and 
accept the outcome, there needs to be some measure of discretion. But the important thing here is that the standard that is built into the Constitution already, that the court has to find by clear and convincing evidence that no combination of conditions would protect the public, that's a pretty good starting point. That's a pretty good starting point for the discussion. And then we just need to think about how the risk pools play in here so that the exercise of discretion under that standard is wise, fair, and reasonably uniform across the state. Thanks for your time. Thank you, David. Hmm. Questions? No, so you're... No, <coughs> yeah, Hi, David. So, thank you. Um, so I especially liked the, um, the history, history lesson here. But um, so what your position is, is that if this passed, then you would follow up with um, more detailed procedures and, and statutes. Just to be clear, I think it makes sense to start the amendment process sooner because it takes a lot longer to, to bring to fruition than a statute. But you would want the statute to have the same effective date as the amendment. Because I share your concern, and I share, share Senator Benning's concern, that if you do this just by itself, it, you're not necessarily opening the floodgates to further detention, but you're certainly increasing the potential for it. Mm -hmm. So you, you would have the statutes that inject the risk assessment and the, all of that that would have right. the same effective date? OK, I see. Right, and probably yeah. more, um, at the same time, you'd probably work on your bail repeal proposal. I mean, clearly, there needs to be some yeah. mechanism to make people show up for court. We don't want to show up for court. Yeah. But uh, you might want to work on uh, you know, eliminating those cases where people are held for $500 bail, <laughs> frankly, to free up some beds for the people who are dangerous that belong there. Yeah. Hey, David, this is Joe Ben. So I, appre I appreciate the, um, the historical reference. And while you were speaking, I was literally reading the Magna Carta. Um, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm hearing you testify about a risk assessment. Are you talking about something like the Ohio risk assessment tool being used at the moment of somebody's arraignment? So, you know, there, right now there's, there's a whole panoply of different tools that are out there. Some of them require interviewing the, uh, the would-be defendant, which could be problematic in and of itself, and others are static, or relying upon immutable factors like uh, you know, criminal history, age, et cetera. Um, and you need to have a public policy discussion about whether it makes sense to use an interview-based system uh, or a static system. Uh, but yes, I would expect that that is a tool that would be administered between the time of arrest and the time of arraignment. Could you envision a wide disparity between prosecutors and how they approach this? Well, that's why it's your job to put us in a smaller box in which to exercise our discretion. OK. Um, I take it that smaller box would be something along the lines of making sure we minimize the number of actual offenses that might be subject to this? Well, I was thinking more in you know, the, the checks and balances inherent in our system of government. You know, in, in the federal system, they use, they, they make a whole without bail or don't hold without bail decision based upon uh, assessments that are administered by pretrial services, which is a branch of the, well, in the judicial branch in the federal system. Uh, so a good priority point might be to have the assessment administered by a neutral party who works for the judicial branch. Do you have any idea how many weight of evidence hearings we would need to add or expect as a result of this change? Well, there is no way to know how judges will exercise their discretion when given this possibility. Um, so I, I honestly can't answer that. What I would say is that because the standard for a weight of the evidence hearing is the same as on a motion to dismiss, the state could proceed surely based upon sworn written statements, and it's not uncommon to do so. And if that were to occur, especially in an uncomplicated case like a typical misdemeanor, it, it would be an awfully short hearing. Okay, thanks. Other questions for David? 
David, you've been extremely helpful, and I, I like the idea of doing a, uh, a bill that's contingent upon passage of the constitutional amendment as well as effective upon the effective date of the constitutional amendment. That would really, I think, um, solidify and help. Uh, I think if, I think every state is grappling with bail. I don't think we're alone in how to deal with this. Um, I think we I think every state recognizes the problem, and I, you know, that, that's how the genesis of this was yours and my conversations about California, and their attempt to use risk assessment. Um, now, right. I, I don't have any particular interest in locking more people up, but just I just want to make sure that who we're locking up are those that need to. But I also am concerned about the number of people, and I don't know if this we can get at this through either legislation or whatever, but the number of people who have significant mental health issues who are being locked up in our correctional facilities because there's no place else to put them. And yes, they're dangerous, but they're not being helped. And those are the ones who are being held longer. If you look at the statistically nationwide, People with mental health illness, with mental illness issues, are the ones being held longer on bail. The general bail population is actually rather short-term stays, uh, but that group is in to the much longer stays, as much as a year, six months to a year, where the others are uh, much shorter. And I don't have the statistics in front of me, but it's an in, it's, it's something we should also be aware of as we're dealing with this problem. Um, I, I brought it up before. I have a constituent, and Matt Valerio was good enough to give me some more information about it, but he's been in jail since October 23rd. Significant mental health issues, assaulted his uh, relative, um, gets held in bail at Marble Valley, and he's still there awaiting the family feeling, you know, if you've already assaulted one of your family members, you really don't want to have him back home assaulting again, but what is the program that you can offer to make us feel comfortable? And, and it's corrections dealing with it when it should be mental health or, di or disabilities. Uh, it's, it's really an unfortunate situation that we've created for ourselves. So I would also like to look at that population as well and how we deal with that population. In this particular case, it was completely predictable. He had been in an out-of-state program under DCF. He turned 18. I think everybody knew he was going to turn 18. I don't think there's any question that that's going to happen. And, you know, not prepared. Uh, I, those are the things that bother me about our current system. I think we also have people who get let out. And I know that police and others that I've talked with who say, you know, you have nothing but a catch and release program. Um, with bail, and I said, have you read the Constitution? Um, and so I want to be able to respond to that as well, that those who you consider really dangerous you know, are being let out, and some people who aren't are being kept in. That's my little spiel. I appreciate your concern. I'm concerned, too. I don't want any more people on detention. We've already, you know, we haven't made a dent in that in 10 years. Thank you, David. Carol, sir. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You too. James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, we struggle with the public perception, perception about bail all the time. Uh, and it really, there is a perception out there that people that are committing crimes and then released should be in prison uh, while they're waiting trial. And, you know, again, just like you said, you look at the Constitution. That's not what bail is for. We're not holding people unless they're committing violent felonies and the evidence of guilt is great and it's, um, or they can't afford their bail. Um, and bail can only be imposed for certain reasons. Um, it's a struggle to educate the public on that, on these issues. Um, and I agree with everything that's been said today that unless you're looking to increase penalties for certain offenses, that changing the Constitution is a mandatory prerequisite towards moving towards a risk-based system that doesn't involve the charge. Um, it involves the risk of the individual, and that's 
either the risk to reoffend or the risk to the public. You know, there's issues that need to be worked out there. Um, and then that would also be a mandatory prerequisite towards eliminating cash bail altogether. Um, from time to time, I think when an act could be charged as a misdemeanor or a felony, there is pressure on a prosecutor to charge it as a felony in order to hold someone on bail or hold someone without bail. This eliminates that pressure and to a certain extent. Um, you know, risk to the public is what's important here and that's what the prosecutor's job is to protect. Um, but I absolutely hear the concerns. Um, you know, the constitutional amendment that's proposed doesn't really talk about risk to reoffend or risk to the public. I don't, I don't think. Um, there's no real discussion of what a violent offense is. So both of these leave open the door to a future General Assembly to expand the use of hold without um, through statute, statutory changes. There is likely, I mean, the other concern, which I think is probably true, is that you know even if you move to a risk-based system, I don't think there's many judges out there that would release a murderer uh, or an alleged murderer, um, <coughs> even if they scored a low risk to reoffend. So there is the possibility that you're not going to decrease the whole without population, but you might increase it. I mean, I think. No, that, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. Um, I also have concerns about risk assessments in general. Um, you know, I think the Yazi is a good one that we're using that for the youthful offenders. Um, I think the ORAS is good, but they're, you know, I'm on a committee right now that's uh, being staffed by NJCSS or um, NJCSG uh, is part of it, and we're looking at are there are these risk assessments entrenching racial racial biases into our criminal justice system? Um, are they accurately predicting risk? Is it risk to reoffend for the for the offense that is before us, or is it just a general public safety risk? Um, we're, this group is actually going to do a retroactive study on a new risk assessment to see how effective it is um, at predicting risk. Do they rely on kind of previous criminal histories, and if so, are those criminal histories kind of infected with racial biases? Um, you know, th these are the kind of questions that come to mind when I think about moving towards a risk-based system and how to accurately predict that. I know the federal system uses risk assessments and um, seems to be working. Um, I don't know if there's any studies on how effective it's working, but I think it seems to be working. Um, I think the crimes that we're certainly most concerned about um, are the criminal threatening, the stalking, the domestic assaults, violation of abuse prevention orders. Those are the ones that I think that have the kind of potential for real, real lethality, real disruption, real just dangerous outcomes. But then there's also the ones that you're just not going to know um, that could be risky. The, it, the individual could be a real threat to the public, but the, the only thing that they could be charged with, uh, you know, David mentioned disturbing the peace through electronic communications, um, carrying a deadly weapon, um, those are potentially dangerous situations and you don't want a prosecutor to seek out a more harsh charge in order because they, they think that this person is a real public safety risk. Um, I, I cringe at even mentioning it, but you know, a more robust electronic monitoring system, um, <laughs> uh, pre-trial that's in real time. Mm -hmm. I think that the the one that was down, it was run through Keith Clark's office, was actually very effective. It was very. Effective. It was just, and I don't know the full history of it, but it became incredibly expensive. Um, I can tell you the history of it and why it became expensive. And I'm not fully prepared to flesh out maybe the due process or constitutional issues right now, but having some sort of potential joint custody um, between DMH and DOC pre-trial for people that maybe don't rise to the level of 
um, person in need of treatment, but people that do have significant behavioral and mental health issues, um, they, they, those people could be released, but then there'd be some sort of... Well, is there a general agreement that people, that the statistics are correct, that people with mental illness nationwide spend more time without, you know, being held on bail conditions than people in the general, general offenders? I've heard those statistics, and I would assume that, you know, so from time to time. I think CSP can probably give us that statistic. They've got a mental health effort. Unfortunately, their mental health effort is based on counties, and counties have a stepping up provision, and the stepping up is to, to deal with the mental health problems within their county in a different way rather than the criminal justice system. And so the stepping up initiative is designed so County X, which has um, the, you know, the sheriff who runs the jail and the typical county government around the country <coughs> getting those counties, but they haven't been able to kind of put it together for those states with a unified system like Vermont. But that, that's where all my statistics are coming from is the stepping up initiative. So I think you can uh, look at that. It would tell you that significant amount of time is spent by because nobody knows what to do with the mental health patients. They don't divert them quickly. How is the genesis of mental health courts and other things? I did a resolution here a few years ago on the stepping up initiative, but it's just a resolution. It doesn't mean much. Um, you know, so I, I don't know what we do with unified systems. I've been kind of, when I go to the board meetings, I bring it up every year and you're getting kind of tired of it. Joe. Um, James, I see this proposal as a one-way street. There's nothing about this proposal that is going to decrease the number of people incarcerated or do agree with them. Just this proposal in isolation. Yes. Um, I, I no. I mean, there's. I don't see. Uh, I mean, because it doesn't change the whole without. It just adds more it, people it, that could be eligible. Right. Right. You would agree with me then also that there's nothing about this proposal that would decrease the number of court hearings necessary to get from where we are now to where this would take us. Well, for the same reason, no. You were here, I think it was, David, yesterday. You were all talking about deterrence. And sentence structure has virtually nothing to do with deterrence. Would you agree with me that whether there's a statement out there somewhere that you could be held for lack of bail, or without bail, I'm sorry, if you commit this offense, there's nothing about this that's actually going to lead to deterrence. Would you agree with that? The deterrence question, I, you know, I don't necessarily agree. Uh, I do, I do think that certain individuals, especially habitual offenders, that are familiar with uh, what the uh, outcomes for them could be, might be deterred from certain crimes. So, I, I mean, I don't, I don't fundamentally believe that deterrence is out the window with, uh, based on. Good. Um sense of disagreement then between you and the AG's office about that subject. Right. Let, me, let me continue on the road. You testified that a VAPO would be something to think about. VAPO meaning violation of the abuse prevention order. Um, that would include, would it not, a situation where two people are not engaged in any kind of violence but are actually in violation of an communication prohibition. So for instance, a judge has somebody arraigned, um, uh, there's also an abuse prevention order out there that prevents them from having contact, but I'm sure you're aware that in many instances in that scenario, the victim actually commences the conversation with the perpetrator, and that's a VAPA. It's a violation of an abuse prevention order. And the reason I'm bringing all this up is 
somehow or other, we've got to figure out if we're going to go down this road. And I, I understand the rationale for it, because this is all driven by the typical revolving door case that we see in the press. And we all get picked on because we allow these folks to go out and people have never read the Constitution. They won't understand. But I think the conversation is critical, for me at least, that the exact offenses for which you could become subject to this um, is as narrow as possible to prevent overuse. And I'm not picking on any one particular um, prosecutor who shall name, who shall remain nameless, but I'm very familiar with. Um, there are frustrating situations in small town communities where it could be drug related, it could be uh, there's just family animosity for years and years. And one quick way of resolving all of that is to say, I'm going to use this tool to my best advantage. And to me, that presents potential problems that we don't want to get involved in. So I'm, I asked Jay, there's a list of specific offenses. I guess I would ask you and David as well if he's going to testify. What, what is it exactly we're trying to cure without going overboard um, in presenting situations that increase our need for bed space and increase our need for court time? I want to have that as limited as possible to take care of the ultimate problem, which is the revolving door public image problem that this all presents. So I'll pick up directly from there, which is to say that I do see that this would be a big expansion of hold without bail. And as far as you know, the extent to which that could be limited by um, sort of collateral legislation, you know, I think it's my sense that for the most part, our legislation where it is bound by the Constitution hews pretty closely to the constitutional baseline. There are a few places where we have legislation that provides protection above and beyond what the Constitution provides, but it's, you know, I, I can't count the number of times uh, in this building that I have been in committees, not necessarily this committee, and the real question a committee has had in setting laws is, what does the Constitution allow, and that's where we will set the law. And I, even if it was initially something where there was um, statutory protections that went beyond the constitutional provision, the, uh, you know, it would be sort of a natural regression for it to sort of slowly roll back to that constitutional baseline, which would represent a really tremendous expansion of hold without bail. I mean, the offenses we're talking about here, um, two offenses that are in the top five most commonly charged offenses are, and I'm going off of statistics from a few years ago because I don't have the most recent ones here. So these are from, uh, I believe, a CRG report from 2015, um, looking at the last five years of charges. And at that point, um, two of the most five commonly charged offenses in Vermont were simple assault and disorderly conduct by fighting or tumultuous behavior, both of which would fit into this category. And none of the other most commonly charged offenses in Vermont fit into that hold without bail category. So you're really talking about in that, that hold without bail category, which is a very um, procedurally intensive process. You know, I respectfully disagree with David Cahill's assertion that these hold without bail hearings, the weight of the evidence hearings that you have to hold, would be very simple and straightforward. They're actually not. There are many trials. Um, and while certainly the prosecution and a, and a weight of the evidence hearing can go forward, on evidence that wouldn't itself be admissible in a trial, um, that only serves to shorten the proceeding a bit. Uh, you know, recently I've been involved in a couple of them. One of them was a day and a half. One of them was half a day. And you would be doing, you would be putting those types of hearings in all over the place. And I would also disagree. That's been described in a few points as um, some sort of real barrier to holding somebody without bail is the weight of the evidence hearing. We hold way to the evidence hearings. We very rarely win way to the evidence hearings. And the reason is that the, um, the standard that the legislature put in, which is that the weight of the evidence is great, doesn't actually mean the weight of the evidence is great. The Vermont Supreme Court interpreted that to mean uh, that, it, that actually the weight of the evidence is just minimally sufficient to sustain the charge. So um, I think uh, Attorney Pepper mentioned it, that the when you hold the weight of the evidence here, if you win it, you get your charge dismissed because the standard for dismissing a charge and the standard for the weight of the evidence is great are exactly the same, um, which is 
I don't think an actually a correct interpretation of the constitutional amendment that the legislature passed, um, but it's what the Vermont Supreme Court has held, so that's the, that's the definition we're stuck with. So it provides, it's a lot of procedure, and we certainly, you know, there's no reason when you have a client who's being held without bail not to avail yourself of that procedure, but it's also not much of a protection against being held without bail because all it means is that the prosecution has some evidence, no matter how minimal, to satisfy every element of the offense, which is exactly what they need to bring the charge in the first place. Um, so this would result in a lot more hold without bail, a lot more court time, a lot more um, detention. detention, and a lot more energy expended on the part of prosecutors and defense attorneys, because honestly, preparing for a way to the evidence hearing is not a small feat. It really is a mini trial. You have to prepare for sort of all but a trial. Um, I think you know the two that I've done recently really took you know hours and hours and hours of my time uh, just to prepare for those. And so to expand that into like one of the largest categories of offenses that's prosecuted in Vermont really would have an impact on the courts. Um, I also want to touch on a couple of other things. Um, first, as far as risk assessments go, I just want to be clear that we're really behind the curve on risk assessments. We have no risk assessments that deal with bail in Vermont right now. Neither does New York. They talked about it when they were implementing their new bail um, system, but they didn't implement one. Uh, so there's not a lot of good examples of people using uh, actuarial risk assessments for bail purposes, even though I think there's pretty universal interest in it around the country. Also, pretty universal skepticism. There's been a lot of studies of these actuarial risk assessment tools that show that they sort of adopt the, uh, because they're all based on prior data, so you look back at justice system data and you use that data to create a forward-looking risk assessment. And one of the problems with that is if the justice system data that you are using reflects uh, racial or economic or other kinds of biases, that will be incorporated into the risk assessment tool. And there's been some studies that have shown that with particular tools. Um, whether or not uh, there's you know studies out there, or whether or not there's tools out there that don't fall into that trap, um, you know, is certainly something worth looking at. I would just say that I think we're at the very beginning of that stage, not at sort of a point in that process where we're ready to start, you know, passing laws and implementing things. Emily, um, <laughs> so finally, I would just say that I think that um, you know this particular proposal I think would be counterproductive. I think the legislature's worked really hard to reduce the uh, incarcerated population over the last handful of years, and I think that this would absolutely, without a doubt, increase the uh, incarcerated population. Um, really, you know, I can't quite picture what sort of collateral laws would go along with it that would lead to a decrease. I mean, this is such a vast expansion at one of the most sensitive points in the process because, uh, you know, another sort of important piece of this is the way the Vermont Supreme Court describes the constitutional provision that says that um, someone who, who has, who's, who's alleged to have committed a felony with an act of violence and therefore may be held without bail, the Vermont Supreme Court describes that as changing the presumption, that they are presumed non-bailable and it is up to them to prove that they are in fact bailable. And so what that would mean is that in these cases, thousands and thousands of cases a year, um, that we would be adding to that hold without bail category, <coughs> they would, for the most part, at least go in and do some time because as a practical matter, when you're a defense attorney, you meet your client for the first time at arraignment. You don't have what it takes to prepare a, a, an adequate bail argument to overcome a presumption. You can turn the sound up. To overcome a presumption of hold without bail um, actually <laughs> takes, a lot of, calls. Takes, a lot of, takes a lot of work, and it's more work than you can do in the very brief time you have before someone is arraigned. So the standard is what, you know, what typically happens in felony cases uh, where there's an element of violence is the person is held without bail initially, and you schedule a bail review, and then you go in, and put, that, that gives you enough time to put on a good case for bail review to try to overcome that presumption of non-bailability. Um, 
you know, that happens. It happens in a very few cases because we have very few violent felonies in Vermont. We're one of the, you know, as far as violent, serious violent crime goes, we're the, state, the safest state in the country. We have one of the lowest rates of serious violent crime. Second safest. So, um, so we have one of the lowest rates of serious Maine violent crime. Maine has just taken over us. They beat us? That's uh -oh. upsetting. Um, <laughs> But so we, you know, it is a very small pool of crimes to then expand that into the thousands and thousands and thousands of violent misdemeanors that get charged every year is really going to mean that a lot of people are going to spend, you know, even just a short period of time in jail while we prepare a case to try to overcome that presumption of non availability So I, I think without a doubt this would increase uh, the you know, the need for DOC beds, it would increase the number of people being held, it would increase the need for prosecutors and defense attorneys who would be preparing and doing this work. Um, frankly, it would probably increase the need for judges and court time since that's already, um, you know, a real, I don't want to say a crisis, I think Grierson might say a crisis, but um, a problem. You know, we are very stressed as far as judge and court mm -hmm. time in Vermont, and I think this would add to that. So for those reasons, we are opposed to this, and I'll answer any questions, but I imagine my time is almost up. Well, not completely. Um, I didn't expect any different. Um, but again, the conversation is not necessarily, are you in favor of PR number seven? Should we be looking at our bail laws, and how should we refine those bail laws? And are they working as we intended them to be? Which, to me, the intent was to protect us from people who are a danger to themselves or others. And that's the key. And I, and I have the sense that we are locking people up who do not need to be locked up, and we are letting people out who should be locked up. And how do we get there? That's my goal. I don't really care if my name's on this particular piece of constitutional amendment or legislation, I just care that we have a system that's rational. And I understand, you know, both the comments from Phil and, and Joe and, and yourself and others about this proposal, and I don't mind that. I, you know, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, it matters what you think, don't get me wrong, but it, what, what I'm trying to do is get the conversation going about how should we correct the system. And I did hand out this stepping up initiative because it is designed for counties. But, and I know a few counties have established um, mental health courts. I think Chittenden County is the only place. And it's, it seems to me that that's one of the problems we could identify clearly um, as, as part of this overall effort. But I mean, I'm sure you see it with some of your clients that you're surprised that they didn't get locked up, and others you're just sh shocked that they got locked up. And there's no rationale for it. And that you're looking at it statewide rather than county by county. I agree with you, and I, I do think that um, one of the most interesting things, and if I was making a suggestion to the committee about sort of where to proceed in looking at bail, um, the thing that I find most interesting and that even even though know, it's my job to have opinions about this stuff, I still haven't come up with an opinion about it. So I, I, I'm genuinely curious from the perspective of I, I'd like to know more is about the use of, um, you know, pre-arrangement uh, screening tools, actuarial risk assessment tools. I know that there's problems with them. I know that there are some tools in particular that have come under real criticism. Um, but I also know that there's a lot of people, really smart people, who look at those as being you know, potentially sort of the magic bullet when it comes to being a lot more accurate about who we lock up and who we don't. And one of the things that that would lend itself to is identifying people who have uh, mental illness very early in the process. You would have a, you know, could, it could potentially be part of that screening process, could be not just a risk screening, but also a screening to identify particular needs that need to be served as early as possible in the process. So. To me, that's um, that, that is the stepping up initiative is diverting those people with mental illnesses who are coming into the criminal justice system. <coughs> excuse me, at the earliest possible point. And that's something that very well could fit in very, you know, very neatly with a pre-arrangement risk assessment type of a model. Uh, you know, to me, the question is just: Is there a pre-arrangement risk assessment that is actually valuable and accurate? And if so. 
is it implementable in Vermont? Um, and I'm really curious about that. That you know, if I was making a suggestion for where the conversation about bail would go, that would be my suggestion: is um, to you know either bring somebody in from outside or put together a group of people from inside Vermont to look at what tools are out there, how could they be implemented in Vermont, are they accurate, are they effective, um, and what would implementation look like?